All right, finally back in Building 26. Mark, how are you? Who Charles? are you? Uh, good, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, it's good to have you back and do another Channel 9 interview. The last one was a lot of fun. So who, I'm Mark Arsinovich. I'm yeah. a technical fellow in the Windows division. You're sitting right in the heart of things in Building 26. Yes. Where CoreOS division is basically centered. Uh huh. And I'm working on long-term architectural stuff for Windows. Cool. And I know everybody knows that Windows 7 is under development now. But yes. A lot of the things that I'm looking at are beyond Windows 7. Beyond Windows 7. Beyond Windows 7. Although part of my role it, on the Core Architecture Committee, which I told you about last time, yes. is to provide architectural guidance and mm -hmm. oversight for what's currently being developed. So there are Win 7 things that we meet and talk about. So that's what a technical fellow does, huh? Well, actually, technical, there's about 20 <laughs> technical fellows at Microsoft, and each one does different things. So okay. it's, it's more of a, it's a technical title. It's not a positional or operational kind of title. Okay. So there's technical fellows that manage giant groups of people. Interesting. Like Terry Crowley is a technical fellow over in office, okay. and he's got a big org underneath him that he manages. And okay. Brad Levering also manages a whole bunch of people. And then you've got people that are individual contributors like me. Cool. So let's get a little bit, before we dive into the one of the purposes of this interview, what's it been like? I mean, you come from the outside world into the Death Star. Yeah. What's it like? How's, it, how's your experience been? It's just been fantastic. Cool. hundred percent. No yeah. complaints at all. Wow. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> That'd be a nice job, wouldn't it? Yeah. Um, no, there's, there's good days and bad days for... Uh, you know, the interesting thing is at Winternals, uh -huh. there was about 85 people at the time of the, the acquisition. And when a company like that, that's your own, is really small, you have a lot of direct influence over everything. There's sure. nothing that happens that you don't know about and can exert influence over. But as the company gets bigger and bigger, yeah. you start to become uh, more of a, a sales person. You've got to convince people the right, their direction. You know, you what you say carries a lot of weight because of who you are, but mm. you still have to convince people that... You know, if they think you're doing taking the company in some stupid direction, they're not going to want to go there. They're not going to be effective, right? So, sure. Um, being in the position I'm in is a lot like that, mm. actually, because I don't manage people. I can't tell them directly what to do. But mm -hmm. for long-term strategic stuff, it's more of convincing people the right things. And well, I, w I would just interject this. I mean, I don't. I've never managed anyone else in my almost nine, ten years here at Microsoft. And I also get the sense that it's hard for managers to tell people what to do. Yeah. So my manager can't tell me what to do. <laughs> Jeff knows much yeah, better. He's got to convince you, right? Yeah, he has to convince me. Yeah. And that's sort of, I mean, you have, you know, it doesn't. If somebody is your manager, it doesn't mean they're smarter than you, yeah. right? Or know more than you, or you know, they just basically want to be in the managerial track. But, right. But so you, of course, work with a bunch of architects and engineers and Windows, who are pretty bright people. Right. Um, and so I, I would, with a lot of rich history. Um, and you want to try to take Windows in a new direction, I would imagine. I mean, mm -hmm. multiple people do. So you have to sort of wean yourself from the past. Yeah. Which, so it must be very interesting. I'd love to hear some of those debates. Well, that's, that's, I mean, that's part of it is, uh, and that, that is one difference between managing, though, is that you control resources. You mm -hmm. can, within what you manage, you can shift resources around to emphasize the things you think are important. Right? <laughs> but, and that as an individual contributor, I, I have to get other people to shift their resources to things uh -huh. that that I think are important and convince them are important as well. Sure. But yeah, there's definitely debates. There's juggling the current, the, the near future and the long-term future mm. you know, and the business requirements of keeping Windows going. Absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, one of the things, I mean, without getting into specifics, um, I remember when we talked to Core Arch uh, probably two years ago now when, when Rob was still running it, mm -hmm. um, and one of the comments that was made in there was that they think about the version beyond the next version after the next version after the next version after the next version of this stuff. That's what, <laughs> so that's kind of interesting. If this is a snapshot in the evolutionary trajectory of Windows, yeah. And so you guys spend time thinking about how it's going to evolve. Now, I would ask when the do you use industry trends to help you? With yeah, the absolutely. So I'll software, just give you, yeah, please. I'll give you one, and that's like Flash. Uh -huh. So we look really hard at Flash and what it means for Windows to have ubiquitous Flash, Flash on the motherboard, Flash on the hard disks, mm -hmm. USB flash keys floating around that are as big as, you know, in the near future they'll be as big as today's hard disks. Wow. So what does that mean for the OS and the way that we treat our storage hierarchy and memory and, and then there's new memory technologies coming out. So there's, and there's power management trends. Mm -hmm. So a whole bunch of things that we look at to 
sure. to figure out what should we be doing. It's really hard to look into the future and guess <laughs> what the right thing. Right? Absolutely. So let's talk about the present. Uh, yeah. And we just released our RTN Windows Server, not RTN, did we, yeah, we RTN Windows uh, Server 2008. Actually, right? a release candidate. Release candidate, sorry. Yeah. So release candidate what, two? Uh, uh, something like something that. Something like that. It's yeah. one of the release candidates uh, announced at TechEd, I believe. Sorry, we just RTN Visual Studio today, so yeah. I'm, I'm confused. But So let's talk a little bit about the internals, since you're a sysinternals person. Mm -hmm. um, Let's dig a little bit, you know, give us an overview of what's new in the, in the Windows Server 2008 kernel. So, really timely question, because I happen to be in the middle of writing a TechNet magazine article on Server 2008 kernel changes, and I just, speaking of TechEd, I just came back from TechEd IT Forum where I gave a talk on Server 2008 kernel changes. Excellent. But there's changes across the board, and mm -hmm. they range for everything from better support for NUMA hardware, and NUMA hardware is something that's uh, a trend that is coming at us faster than I think most people realize. Hmm. So while well, it sounds like NUMA, I'm talking about machines that are often the, the big data centers that yeah. a few people have. Actually, this Opteron box right here is a NUMA machine. Really? Yeah. What does that mean? It means that memory is closer to one CPU than the other CPU, or one core, of one socket versus another socket. Interesting. And so sl slight latency difference accessing mem close memory than further away memory. And, and the operating system is aware of that and optimizes for that. Hmm. So, so things, what does the operating system do? To so uh, Server 2003 actually be start, was started to become NUMA aware and one of the things that the scheduler did for example was try hmm. to keep a thread, a thread of execution on the node where its ideal processor is located. So one of the things that Windows scheduler does is it assigns each thread an ideal CPU, kind of its home base and always tries to put it back there. Mm -hmm. The idea being that if a thread gets put back on its CPU that it was just running on, that there's stuff in the cache that's warm for it, and it doesn't have to rebuild that data. Hmm. In a NUMA system, it makes sense to keep the thread close to the CPU, its ideal CPU, on the same node, because then there's hopefully mem data in the memory close to that that's, that's localized to it as well. Okay. And uh, the memory managers undergone a lot of changes in Server 2008 to become more NUMA friendly. So even if a thread gets migrated off its its home base node to another node, when it performs memory allocations, those memory allocations will uh, preferably come from the RAM of its ideal node, mm -hmm. so that if when it gets moved back there, it's close to the RAM that it allocated. Interesting. And so it, Landy Wang has been busy. So, yeah, Landy's actually next door. So. <laughs> Excellent. Cool. So, uh, what else? So, what else? Uh, there's this scheduler's changed, and some of these changes actually are in, in the Vista kernel. Okay. And in fact, the Vista kernel is really a snapshot of what the server kernel has become. And in, in Vista SP1 and Server 2008 RTM mm -hmm. are going to be very close to each other. Interesting. Uh, and I, I don't know if they'll be the exact same kernel, but they'll be very close to each other. And so that means that all of the things that are in the kernel, at least, or all those capabilities are in the both OSs. Mm -hmm. There's some layered functionalities that are only in one or the other, or some things that only make sense in one or the other. But uh, so the NUMA stuff, for example, I'm running Vista right here. It's mm -hmm. you know, mem Landy's memory manager stuff is <laughs> optimizing Good. the performance from my NUMA box right here. Just cool. a two-way Opteron. Most uh, Opterons, uh, multi-socket Opterons, are NUMA machines. Okay. Um, but some of the other things, uh, there's prioritized I.O., there's prioritized memory, there's uh, cycle-based scheduling, so the scheduler keeps track of how many cycles threads uh, use in its scheduling decision decisions. Um, the big one, of course, is the hypervisor, Hyper-V, which mm. is the new name announced for the hyper uh, virtualization okay. technology. So it's our introduction of uh, Windows hypervisor layer. That's a big feature of Server 2008. There's uh, the transactional NTFS and transactional registry, nice. which uh, allows you roll back and commit ACID transaction semantics on those two resources and plugs in with higher level res transaction resource managers like SQL, so you can have transactions that span a bunch of different resources. Nice. There's uh, cancelable I.O., which is a, mm. it sounds like a little small feature, but it actually is a big one, cancelable create I.O.s. Mm. And on, on client systems, this shows up as you 
net using some offline network share and being able to, to control see it 